and you arrived at the end of that into a room in which there was absolutely nothing except the room was filled with a volume of violet light. So you started with an object and ended with nothing. After those uh, large, uh, messy action paintings of the late 50s, I knew I had to start honing down, eliminating all those arbitrary gestures. The paintings were out of control. So essentially, I took myself a format in which I had total control. That is, I made the paintings very small so that every single drop of paint in there was something I intended. And doing the small paintings, I put them in wood frames so that you actually held them in your hand so that you were in tactile contact because the paintings were just surface changes, rough and smooth and really more on a tactile level than any kind of image level at all. At that point, I became concerned that you could still raw shock them, that it's a cow jumping over a moon or that it's grass or it's sky. So I asked the question, what is the least image evoking kind of mark? And it was a straight line. They were kind of, in the beginning, kind of like pickup stick paintings, and they had a lot of energy and a lot of action and interaction with them. And slowly the lines began to straighten out, and less and less lines were there. And before I knew it, I had gotten to the point where I was painting a series of paintings that had basically four straight lines on them. I figured out a way to put the lines on so that I could move them around a bit. And uh, an interesting thing started to happen, especially when you do that for two years. <laughs> I would spend all day just looking at these lines, moving them up and down. Only the thing that would happen in the beginning, because I didn't have this good level of concentration, is I would sit there and look, and they would just really basically mesmerize me. And after a while, I would just kind of go. And I'd, then I'd wake up 10, 15, 20 naps a day, I mean, these little short naps. After a while, though, I got really quite fascinated by the fact that I could start to see the most subtle kind of nuance. And I began to feel that I actually was aware that the entire painting was restructured. And I became, for the first time, aware of how critical the eye is. I started out playing the races at $2 better when I was in high school. It was a fun game, interesting kind of game. After a while, I got involved with how intricate the game was, and it was kind of my first philosophic lesson. Highest amount of emphasis on discipline, highest amount of emphasis on the ability to organize and sort your information. Two, five dollar exacta, five, six, three dollar exacta, nine, one, Three dollar exacta, nine, eight. A certain amount of the information is mathematical, I mean, the percentages and what have you. But finally, there's a whole other level of information, which is actually tactile in nature, or just really, in a sense, paying attention or attending what's going on. Because every single thing that's going on is becomes an element within it, the structure of the betting, how everyone else feels about the race, the look of the horse on the racetrack, uh, even to things like whether the trainer is wearing a tie on Thursday, which after a while you can actually handicap. He wears that tie 10 times in a meeting and he wins seven. He has, you have to take it in as a factor. So it's as complex as you can get. You put all that information together at the last minute, you rub your hands over it, and you try and get a feel for what makes the most sense, makes the best bet. Stay with him, stay with him, stay with him. 
By the early 60s, I was starting to ask myself some real hard questions about paintings. This led me to the idea of minimizing the imagery and maximizing the actual presence of the painting, that it was more about the feel in the painting and not about the pictures. I started with all these lines and slowly I was throwing out things because they didn't, they didn't really function, that they really didn't have a purpose for being there. And the next thing I know, I was down to like two lines on a canvas in which there was no action or interaction in the old sense at all. There was no figure and ground. There was no positive and negative. The paintings created a very strong emotional response. When I first showed them, a woman came up to me and said, did you paint these paintings? And I said, you know, yes. And she said, you absolutely must cease. You must cease now. This work is absolutely unacceptable. <laughs> At that moment, for the first time, I realized this idea of the mark and the power of the mark. And so at the time, I thought it was an interesting question. How do you paint a painting without a mark? I made a canvas, carefully curved in all directions, just enough so as that there was a tension. And finally, what I did was to uh, put dots on. I put these very small red dots on, and then between every one of those dots, I made an optically correct opposite color, and they would slowly get softer and softer and softer and softer. It was a very tedious activity to do. In fact, here I am at, at 35 or 38 years old, something, making little dots on a canvas. I was a lot of doubt about what the hell I was doing. You know, full-grown man, that was my occupation, making these little dots. But what you had was, like a field of energy. At first, when you'd look at them, there would be almost nothing there. And then you stand for a moment, and after a while, it just pulsed in front of you. Uh, and yet there was no thing, per se, to look at. At that moment, though, I became aware that the shadow around the edge of the frame sometimes would almost be stronger than anything else. I realized that the all of our, our ideas, all of our concepts, all of our assumptions are essentially all acted out within a frame which we had never even thought about. And there was, there was already a structure which pre-structured everything we did. And the question, of course, was what are the grounds for that structure? And what sense does it make with regards to this kind of painting? It became very clear to me that that was the last vestige of, an of, of the old concept of looking in a way. And that is, if I look around at the world, there are no frames. There are no frames in the world. Actually, the world is essentially continuously knitted. It's an envelope all the way around you, and there are no special frames in the same, or no beginnings and, st and endings in that sense of the word. So the question became, how do you paint a painting that doesn't begin and end at the edge? It's not within a frame. idea to make the shape round, to take away the critical corners so it became more and more neutral as a form. I found these metal workers that would shape these aluminum discs for me. They actually made bodies up for race cars and they did them all by hand. And I put a tube that went onto the wall so that these things stuck out from the wall. And then I started painting them using automotive paints. I started spraying them from a slight distance away, just enough of a distance that the paint, using lacquer, acrylic lacquer, so that the paint, when it hit the surface, had already just begun to dry. So if you shot after like maybe 50 or 100 coats, it would build up a very almost grainy surface, literally a surface almost like a movie screen has, you know, that kind of a, a very pearlescent sort of grainy surface. When I got the paintings finished, I worked out an arrangement for lighting where the edge would actually just meld into the shadows. That was the thing, was to get this painting caught up in the space around it. And uh, 
they were greeted roundly with an amazing amount of negativism. They were declared to not be painting, but at the same time they were declared not to be sculpture, and so they sort of existed in no man's land. So suddenly the questions became much more complex. A lot of people thought I had come to point zero, that there was no place to go. But I had now engaged the space around it, and the issue was, how do I actually deal with that? I mean, what kind of an artist am I? I was outside of the dimensions of art. It has always been defined a world of pictures and objects. And I wondered how other people were thinking about the world at this point in time. So I started talking to mathematicians and physicists and people in other disciplines. And in that process, I met a guy named Ed Wirtz. Here's a man doing most of the physiology for the walks on the moon. He had no interest in art, really, at that time at all. And I, so I came into his office and sort of was introduced, and we started talking. And he had this amazing curiosity, and he had this tremendous ability to sort of ask questions. And we brought in a young artist by the name of James Terrell, so we had a really good three-party kind of dialogue. So we started experimenting with putting ourselves in particular situations. One was, for example, an anechoic chamber. Totally sound, dampened space. Absolutely no sound. This thing is suspended. It's also a Faraday cage, so there's absolutely no electrical impulses passing through it. We had a fourth party bring each of us in, put us in a chair in the middle, and the rules were basically you couldn't walk or move around. Each of us spent maybe three, four hours in there. Absolutely no sound and no light. You came out of the space and you'd walk down the street and the street would be very, very different. And there was a house was a house, a tree was a tree, all those things were the same. But first of all, everything had an energy level to it. Everything was kinetic almost. I mean, everything was just alive. And the quality of colors in that were extremely intense. What happens in that space is that you change your sense threshold. Your audio and your visual senses become really heightened. And you also change your sense dependence. In other words, your other senses are really activated. I mean, it's a really nice revealing thing. The world does not necessarily look how we think it looks. I mean, as I say, things are things. But why and how we see them and at what level they, in a sense, impinge upon our conscience, the degree that we let them in, i.e. value them, radically changes our, our world view. And so you first time start really realizing that, that, that the process of perception, which we kind of take for granted as if it's given, is not given, that we actually do it. And that perception is essentially one of the great beauties of our lives, one of the great strengths of our lives. By the late 60s, I had pretty much engaged the entire space around the object. And I began to try and figure out a way to make a non-object art. I uh, experimented with light, started with big sheets of glass and that, and finally developed these tall acrylic columns. I was not interested in them as an object. And as you moved around them, at one point they would be not there at all. At another point, they would be just a black line in the air, or if you moved further, it would suddenly become a silver line. So that they came and went and manifested themselves in the space. I decided that it was absolutely imperative that I understood the main philosophic arguments that underwrote all the dialogues about these issues. I had to pick a place, and it was phenomenology, which is a very hard place to begin reading when you don't read. And I sat down with Hegel 
And I wrote down everything Hegel said in red. And I wrote down all my responses in green. And I did it every day for months on end. In other words, it's the only thing I did every day. I had no ambition, no action. And the idea of literally looking at somebody weave their way through all the most complex kinds of thoughts about why and who we are and why we do what we do and how we think, it's a marvelous thing. I've tried to do that to some degree about why I'm an artist and how I'm an artist. And it comes from this process of self-educating. There it is, right there. We've got to make a U-turn. The reason I come all the way to this one is because they have the right kind of ice and they'll pour it the way I want it poured. And there's a difference. How's everything today? Everything's terrific. Right about. When I was in Las Vegas spending 12 hours a day reading philosophy and the only time I would stop was to go get a Coke. And at one point I suddenly realized there's no sense having one unless you have a really great one. And so I put it all together, the ride, the music, I take myself a little break. It's my philosopher's walk. It was early in the 70s and I had a studio at that time in Venice. And it was a great studio, but uh, the questions that I had been following had led me to a place in which making things was no longer critical to actually exploring what the nature of art was. And I had absolutely no idea how to deal with that. It seemed the only thing that I could possibly do was to get rid of the idea of being a studio artist. So I did. Uh, I just closed up the studio, sold everything, and there I was, not knowing what to do or where to go. For about a year or so, I was really not able to work. I started spending a lot of time alone and spending a lot of time in the desert, wandering around a little bit, sort of trying to think about what I do. We really are constantly pushing towards this thing of the presence of something. I could argue that the only real moment is that first moment of actually being there, running your hands intimately over a situation, and being in the presence of something that really has impact on you. Every step from there is by degrees an abstraction. The idea of photography is a classic example in which we think the photograph can actually somehow emulate or record the moment. It does, but only in the terms of images, but it has none of the, in a sense, subsidiary information, which is uh, the quality of the light, the feeling of, the, of, of this rock on my, on my ass right now, uh, no sense of the way the, the breeze is blowing across me, uh, the sound in the sense of its relationship to the space and the distance close behind me, far in front of me. All those things overlap and coalesce and make a moment. The desert was a great place to, in a sense, encounter that phenomena as pure phenomena. It doesn't have those kinds of things that we normally identify and say, well, there's those beautiful trees there and look at this thing there. There are events in the desert but actually, the desert's at its best because it's sort of stripped of all those kinds of rhymes and reasons and has only its presence. And there are moments when the desert, it's really in its beauty, it just stands up and hums. And when it hums like that, you're in the presence of it. And then all of a sudden, it'll be gone. Where I crossed over and recognized the world of phenomena was when I really became aware that the shadow was as real as the center of the painting. The shadow has actually no physicality. You can't weigh it, you can't measure it. It's completely transient. 
And so in one level, on a quantitative level, it actually has no existence. And yet on another level, it is absolutely critical. You cannot see without these shadows. The world of phenomena is that which is in constant transit. These are not lies. These are a part of the textural richness of the world. And in terms of our perception, it is filled with these qualities which really enrich our lives. These were the thoughts, these were the questions I was thinking about, sort of riding around in the desert alone. And this idea of moving towards the phenomena made perfect sense to me, so I really tried to deal with that. One of the key things that I touched upon was operating in response. My invitations at the beginning were from galleries or museums, and what I would do is I would come to the site in response to this invitation, and I would take the site as given, whatever they offered me, whatever set of circumstances. So I began essentially with the space and tried to let the space reveal itself to me in a way which informed all the decisions I would make. Most of these spaces were pristine white boxes. And in responding to those, the works were very, very subtle. What you try to do is set up a situation in which you can have that, what scientists call the aha experience, where something, where you walk in and say, oh my God, this is, you know, and you have that moment in which something really happens, which are the most memorable moments in our lives. And those are best known when they're unstructured. So I would try and leave as few traces of myself as possible and set up the circumstances with the idea that this may take place. I was interested in that whole experience of being in there, not being in there to look at something, but rather being in there, period. The first invitation I got to actually do one was at the Museum of Modern Art. Uh, two friends of mine came when I was working, and I could tell that they were having great difficulty because they were, they were sort of standing on one foot and then on the other saying, hmm, yes, it's uh, kind of interesting in that. And there's that kind of strange moment where you don't know, you know, how, how people are going to deal with it. And there was a small little screen across the entrance to the door. The museum was open in the evening that evening, and a black kid came through there, about 15 years old. And he got in the room and I could tell by his body language that he was really, he really was getting it. He was really moving around. And I realized that the difficulty was just the question of, is it art? My friends who were having to struggle with this transition from that old idea of art encased in objects and in painting to this phenomenal life, that was very difficult. But to just simply allow yourself to do it was not difficult. I'm not trying to tell people what to do or how to see or what's right or what's wrong. I'm trying to set up a situation in which they really perceive themselves perceiving and realize they're the magic. I began to slowly understand more and more that the real art is the experience. The viewer actually looking at what the artist has given them as an extended way of looking at the world. It's about seeing, it's about being aware. It's something that once you gain it, you carry it with you all the time and you live in an enriched world. The beauty of all this is that it's totally free. It is something that you have every moment of your life. When you walk through the world, you can see things and I see things that are more interesting and more beautiful than anything I've ever made.
The initial mock-up in the garage in San Diego led to a lot of other ideas and possibilities. What we're doing is we're masking off a rectangular shape at the center of each grim, and then we're going to paint each one black. I think that'll give the piece more weight and more spatial character. But you actually don't know where this thing is going until it's basically done. Actually, there's still a possibility that it won't work at all. You know, when you're trying to grab something ephemeral, uh, it sometimes you just don't get a hold of it. I mean, and when you don't, then there's nothing. It's not like if you have an object that already is and has some dimensions and some interest. This either has it or it doesn't have it. And so you just have to say, I can't do it. You got you to see what museum people do when you tell them you've got no show. <laughs> The art doesn't reside in the object. The art in the object or the art in a set of circumstances is in a sense the opportunity for you to have this moment of awareness, this moment of really in a sense touching something special that human beings can touch. So that what you walk out of the room with somehow is what's of value. If I say to you, you can make something, and it is going to be so beautiful, it's going to be the best thing you've ever done. Only one problem. It's only going to last for 20 minutes. And you have to make a decision. And it really is a reflection of your values, where you're placing the value, what you place the value on. If the value is the experience, then it doesn't die in that sense. It essentially is incarnate in you. You essentially now act on and are a result or a kind of collection of all those experiences. And so the idea of something being ephemeral or that you can own it or not own it, it doesn't make any difference. Actually, if you take the position that, that in fact we do perceive and that we are the important thing, then nothing is lost. What I'd wanted to do all along was to actually bring in the richness of the outside. And finally, by the 1980s, the idea of working in response began to generate more eccentric kinds of invitations. And these were for sites and situations that were more and more public in their character. Atriums, urban plazas, uh, airports, and so on. The whole issue really was about context. It was not about objects at all. It was about how we perceived objects in context. The object may be there, but you don't see it separate from or outside of the context it's in. That was probably the biggest, most dramatic shift I made, even more than stopping being a painter. And in a funny way, I was at the point zero where there was nothing, I, you know, nothing left or no place to go and no thing and such. And suddenly I was like on a precipice with everything possible.
There was no tool I couldn't use, no medium I couldn't use, no technique that was not legitimate in context. These are very, very different contexts. Each calls for an entirely different kind of response. When I talk about public art, I really always use the phrase art in public places. That is, that there is a motivation that comes out of the history of art in which we're trying to, as it were, exercise certain ideas in the world. And on the basis of that, I'll look at their space and then in time develop a project which is in line with all the things that I need to do and want to do. about like that on the back. The hip might be just a little higher. I bring this idea to them. Now they may have doubts and they may have reservations. They're not concerned with any of the issues that have motivated me to even come to this activity. Um, we have to build up the mound, we have to grade it, we have to in a sense find Because I'm not just doing a piece, but to do a piece in line with this new aesthetic, with this new philosophy. I have to put the rocks in. Now, I'm assuming that if the project I'm doing, that if it makes real sense, makes sense in the space, even though it comes from my motivation, that it should possibly make sense in terms of their motivation. I, mean, I love what you're doing in the second inner circle, but I'm uncomfortable with that particular mass being there as a part of it because I you think You are in a situation which is riddled with contradictions because what I'm doing right now is testing these ideas in the world. You have to understand that the world is not interested in that. They're going along just fine and dandy with the ideas that they've got. The three different prices I got were, uh, the most expensive is 431, path being the real critical element, the cheapest being 235. I think we're at a moment for clarifying what the role of the artist really is in here. I mean, this whole process that I'm involved in is probably not going to even get sorted out in my lifetime. The first element that I think could be repeated continuously, this idea that at certain moments, It's amazing how many of these projects fall apart for reasons that nobody can predict. Chicago didn't get built because a large, a large insurance company went broke right in the middle of it. New Orleans didn't get built because the mayor realized that it was a political hot potato. He could probably lose his job over it. Falling water didn't get built because the man whose project it was died. Ohio State didn't get built because it was actually at no point higher than 18 inches. But by the time it had got translated through the school paper, everyone had this idea that it was building this giant monster that would block out the sun. So the reasons are just ad infinitum. There are all kinds of things that bear on any site when you come to look at it. And you have to take all of them into account. There's all the physicality of it. There are all the social things involved with it, all the social concerns. There's all the historical ones. And you don't essentially focus on them in a kind of analytical sense, but you do it by kind of massaging of the entire thing, to try and get a feel for how the space is understood, feel for how the space is experienced. In the entrance to Mocha, you go down into a lower plaza, 
And I felt that the whole plaza is uh, too hard. It's the way most plazas are now. Everything's concreted over, everything is hard. And I wanted to, in a sense, do something that softened it up, something that played with the color of that red sandstone that comes from uh, India. And so what I came up with are these large structures with bougainvillea growing out of them. Originally, I considered making it out of bamboo, but it became much too difficult in a temporary installation. So we went to rebar, which is just the most common material possible. I rather like it. It has a little bit of a bamboo character to it. There's 50 of these one-inch rebars, and they converge to about 12 feet high. Interspersed between every one of those is a three-quarter inch rebar. Then the plant material will fan out on this and lay on there, and we'll have instant karma. I am in many ways now involved with other people because every single project asks me to work in ways that I've not worked with before. Jack, before you weld that, let me just, just, just have a little moment here of conversation. I think the bottom is, is too splayed out. This seems to be narrower, slimmer. Yeah, the 11 inches would be closer to the model. So we'd be coming in all the way around That'll make it uh, five feet, four inches in diameter. Mm -hmm. That dimension. How about, how about stability? Is it, is it, we're OK. We're still OK? Yeah. If we came in we're that borderline. much to five and a half, we're borderline. <laughs> what do we do? I'm over my head all the time now. I mean, never know what I'm going to be working with next week. It might be uh, electronics and digital sound and on one hand. and the other hand, it might be planting a tree. I've been growing the bougainvillea for two years now, so it's quite large. There's nothing more interesting than plant material which catches the light and has a lot of uh, filtering of light, and I think that's what the plaza really needs. It's not that easy to start fresh each time, to really do something special in each case. The ability to do, say, what, what one artist does, just to hone one area, is incredible and unique enough. Now I'm asking the question, can that be more complex? Can that, in a sense, be broadened? Can, that, can artists really function in a broader range? And that, that the idea of what we do is not about a tool or a method or an attitude, but rather, in a sense, about an aesthetic which is a piece and a part of a much larger whole. For me to be an artist was, as I said, was not a very easy thing to do. It was not a graceful thing to do. And I kind of, in a way, set the other aspects of my life aside and was able to, apparently. Now I'm at a point in my life, an incredibly, you know, fortunate thing happened. I met Adele. From the first time I saw her, Good. I was taken completely. And, uh, of course, we had to have a child. And a grace is okay. so beautiful and so incredible. Like every father, I'm like uh, giddy about the whole let's thing. Let's get, a, let's, get a, let's get some glue in there, huh? Oh, yeah, it's good, yeah, that's good. And we'll do some sideways. That's good. Give me a shot. Anna Grace. That's sideways. That's sideways. Sure just in sideways. looking back, sideways. it's really quite amazing, I think. Essentially, I've covered so much ground. But the thread has been ah. exactly the same. Another one. The idea of the wonder. Ah! Uh -huh.
the human potential to perceive the world. Following the thread of that, that's the exciting thing, that's the fun thing. And how can you do anything other than just pursue it? Pow! 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 Pow.